I'm Simon Sinek. Everything I do is devoted to one single purpose, to inspire people to do what inspires them. He's the two-time best-selling author whose ideology has captured the imagination of some of the most important leaders of our time, including the heads of many Fortune 500 companies, the U.S. government, and multiple branches of the military, and the United Nations. Our next speaker is going to inspire you to do exactly that, to change, to change how you think, to change how you approach life and how you approach work. There's no one quite like a motivational speaker, ethnographer, and the author of three New York Times bestsellers. Simon's TED Talk on the concept of why is the third most watched of all time. Please help me in welcoming the incomparable Simon Sinek. Do you love your wife? Yes. Right? Prove it. Like, what's the metric? Give me the number that helps me know, right? Because when you met her, you didn't love her, right? Now you love her, right? Tell me the day the love happened. It's an impossible question, right? But it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that it's much easier to prove over time, right? So all leadership is the same thing. It's about transitions. So if you were to, if you were to go to the gym, right? It's like exercise, right? If you go to the gym and you work out and you come back and you look in the mirror, you will see nothing. And if you go to the gym the next day and you come back and you look in the mirror, you will see Nothing, right? <laughs> so clearly there's no results, can't be measured, it must not be effective. So we quit, right? Or if you fundamentally believe that this is the right course of action and you stick with it, like in a relationship, I bought her flowers and I wished her a happy birthday and she doesn't love me, clearly I'll give up. You know, that's not what happens. If you, if you believe there's something there, you commit yourself to act, an act of service. You commit yourself to the regime, the exercise. You can screw it up. You can eat chocolate cake one day. You can skip a, skip a day or two. You know, you, you, it allows for that. But if you stick with it consistently, I'm not exactly sure what day, but I know you'll start getting into shape. I know it. And the same with the relationship. It's not about the events. It's not about intensity. It's about consistency, right? You go to the dentist twice a year, your teeth will fall out. You have to brush your teeth every day for two minutes. What does brushing your day twice a day for two minutes do? Nothing, unless you do it every day, twice a day for two minutes, right? It's the consistency. Going to the gym for nine hours does not get you into shape. Working out every day for 20 minutes gets you into shape. So the problem is we treat leadership with intensity. We have a two day offsite, we invite a bunch of speakers, we give everybody a certificate, you're a leader, right? <laughs> Those things are like going to the dentist. They're very important, they're good for reminding us or getting us back on track, learning new lessons, but it's the daily practice of all the monotonous, little, boring things like brushing your teeth that matter the most. She didn't fall in love with you because you remembered her birthday and bought her flowers on Valentine's Day. She fell in love with you because when you woke up in the morning, you said good morning to her before you checked your phone. She fell in love with you because when you went to the fridge to get yourself a drink, you got her one without even asking. She fell in love with you because when you had an amazing day at work and she came home and she had a terrible day at work, you didn't say, yeah, 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 but let me tell you about my day. You sat and listened to her awful day and you didn't say a thing about your amazing day. This is why she fell in love with you. I can't tell you exactly what day and it was no particular thing you did. It was the accumulation of all of those little things that she woke up one day and as, as if she pressed a button, she goes, I love him. Right? Leadership is exactly the same. There's no event. There's no thing I can tell you you have to do that your people will trust you. It just doesn't work that way. It's, the, it's an accumulation of, of lots and lots of little things that anyone by themselves is innocuous and useless. Literally, pointless by themselves. People will look at little things that are good leadership practices and say, that won't work. And you're absolutely right. But if you do it consistently, and you do it in combination with lots of other little things, like saying good morning to someone, that looking him in the eye. My friend George, who's a three-star general in the Marine Corps, he says his test for leadership, and I love this, he goes, his test for a good leader is if you ask somebody how their day is going, you actually care about the answer. Right? The number of times we're walking to a meeting, we're rushing, we go, how are you, not good, I gotta I got get to you later, I got, I'm late for a meeting. Right. If you ask the question, you are standing there and you're listening to the answer. It's those little innocuous things that you do over and over and over and over that people will say, I love my job. Not I like my job, 
I like my job means, yeah, the challenge is great, they pay me well, I like the people. I love my job means, I don't want to work anywhere else. I don't care how much somebody else will, is willing to pay me. I'm devoted to the people here, and I care desperately about the people here as if they were my family. In business, we have colleagues and co-workers. In the military, they have brothers and sisters. That's how they think of each other, right? If you really have a strong corporate culture, the people will think of each other like brothers and sisters. Don't really, it's like a family, right? No, brothers and sisters. Deep love, fight, but the love doesn't go away, right? Bicker, the love doesn't go away. And I'll fight with my sister, but if you threaten my sister, you're gonna have to deal with me, right? Right? We'll fight internally, we'll bicker with each other, but nobody's gonna hurt each other, and if anything from the outside shows up, you gotta, you're looking at a unified front. Brothers and sisters. Now how do you create brothers and sisters out of strangers? Common beliefs, common values, you know? Parents, in other words, executives who care about their children's success, who care to raise their children, teach them skills, discipline them when necessary, help them build their self-confidence so that they can go on and achieve something more than you could have ever imagined achieving for yourself. That's leadership, an absolute love and devotion for the people who've committed their lives to this enterprise. That's such a brilliant reframe. It's so simple and so beautiful and... And unbelievably hard work. It is and it isn't. Here's, here's why it is. You said it, it's hard to measure, right? It's hard for me to show... It's hard up. to measure in the short term. It's very easy to measure in the long term. Over the long term, the traditional metrics will go up. All your revenues, profits, market share, the traditional metrics will go up and more importantly, they'll go up more stably. Right? You will be able to weather hard times better because the people will come together, they won't abandon ship. Right? Um, in the, over the long term, the traditional metrics are just fine. But also over the long term, your churn will go down. Right? You won't be going through employees as much. Right? Over the long term, you'll find that loyalty is much higher, that people will turn down better paying jobs. Right? Over the long term, all the traditional metrics are just fine, and then some. It's only the short term that it's hard to measure. I was staying at the uh, Four Seasons in Las Vegas, which is a wonderful hotel. And the service there is really great. The reason it's such a great hotel is because of the people who work there. And I had an experience with a young man by the name of Noah. And Noah's a barista in the coffee shop that they have just there in the lobby. And I was buying a cup of coffee and Noah was charming and funny and engaging. And I think I gave a 100% tip. I think my $5 coffee, I think I gave a $5 tip. I mean, this guy was great. I, I loved talking to him. He was a joy. And I asked him, do you like your job? He said to me, I love my job without skipping a beat. And I asked, what is it that the Four Seasons is doing that you love your job so much? He says, well, again, without skipping a beat, he says, throughout the day, managers will walk past and ask how I'm doing and if there's anything that I need. He said, not just my manager, any manager. Wow. He says, I feel supported here. He says, quote, I can be myself, right? Then, ugh, oh, magic. <laughs> and then he says to me, I also work at Caesar's Palace. And there, the managers go around to make sure that we're doing everything right and catch us if we do something wrong. He says, when I go to work at Caesar's Palace, I keep my head just under the radar because I don't want to get in trouble. He says, I just want to get through the day and make a paycheck. Right? Same person. Right? The experience that I have at the Four Seasons will be diametrically opposite to the experience that I have at Caesar's Palace, not because of Noah, but because of Noah's leadership. Right. And the joke is, if I were to go talk to the managers over at Caesar's Palace and say, you know it's you, they'll say, but you don't understand, we cannot get good work out of our people. Look, look, no matter how hard we try and how hard we push them, they just don't, so we either have to replace them or push them harder. No. We respond to the environments we're in. Get the environment right, you get the right behavior. Get the environment wrong, you get the wrong behavior. If that is what is happening, it is because of leadership, not because of the people. Yeah, there was a really famous cartoon back in the 80s, the beatings will continue until the morale improves. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought that was hilarious because it's so terrifyingly accurate. And, and astonishingly, it, you look, I'm embarrassed that I have a career. You know, I talk about things like trust and cooperation. Why is there demand for my work, you know? Um, but the fact that there is, I'll take it as an opportunity. Yeah. Um, but what's really sort of abominable is that this is not 
a new idea. Like there are books galore and speeches galore and articles galore about what leadership is. You know, and we all kind of say the same thing from a different angle. So you can pick your flavor, whichever message resonates most with you. And yet people don't do it. What's the hang up? And so I get this question a lot, which is what are you know, what are the most important characteristics about being a leader? You know, vision, charisma, you know? <laughs> I know some spectacular leaders who don't have big Steve Jobsian visions. They're just not visionary, you know? And I know some spectacular leaders who really don't have a lot of charisma. They kind of just shuffle around and you're like, that's the guy, <laughs> like, that's the guy, right? And they're spectacular and people will give blood, sweat and tears for these people. The one thing I am comfortable saying that all effective leaders must have is courage because it is hard. It is hard to stand up against outside pressure. It is hard to stand up to an external constituency who's pushing you to do something for their short-term gain, to do the right thing for your people. It is hard. It is thankless. It is lonely. Um, it sometimes, sometimes you get fired. Sometimes you get in trouble. Sometimes you'll lose your job and the next guy will get all the credit. It's all true. And the courage to do the right thing in the face of overwhelming pressure, only the best leaders have that courage. Only the best leaders. And here's the folly. Courage is not some deep internal fortitude. You don't dig down deep and find the courage, right? It just doesn't exist. Courage is external. Our courage comes from the support we feel from others. In other words, when someone, when you feel that someone has your back, when you, you, you know that the day that you admit you can't do it, someone will be there and say, I got you. You can do this. That's what gives you the courage to do the difficult thing. It's not going off to an ashram by yourself somewhere for four weeks and coming back and finding the courage. It's not what happens. It's the relationships that we foster. It's the people around us who love us and care about us and believe in us. And when we have those relationships, we will find the courage to do the right thing. And when you act with courage, that in turn will inspire those in your organization to also act with courage. In other words, it's still an external thing. That's what inspiration is, right? I'm inspired to follow your example. But um, those relationships um, that we foster over the course of a lifetime um, will not only make us into the leaders we need to be and, and hope we can be, but they'll often save your life. They'll save you from depression. They'll save you from um, giving up. They'll save you from any matter of you know, negative feelings about your own capabilities, your own future, when someone just says, I love you, and I will follow you no matter what. Why do you, so I, I wanna talk about that for a second. Why do you think that something so innate, so deeply ingrained in us as love is so, like just yesterday, I can't believe this is true, this is actually true, I'm not making this up. Just yesterday, this will mean something to you guys. I looked Ron Penna in his eyes and I said, I love you. And I said it like 100% is my business partner. I said it 100% sincerely. It was just one of those moments where uh, you want to you wanna connect and remember. But that's so weird. Like, I don't do that often. Uh, and it's so interesting that it becomes out of context sure. maybe is the best way to say it. Because like at home with my wife, it's so easy and I love to embody it and I love to feel it and it makes me feel awesome. But then I come into the office and there's something about the context mm -hmm. that makes it weird. Yes, two perspectives. Uh, one is, uh, this is what vulnerability is, right? Uh, being vulnerable doesn't mean crying. Being vulnerable means willing to admit you made a mistake. Being vulnerable is the willingness to say, I need help. Being vulnerable is the willingness to express the feelings you have towards someone um, without fear of what other people may think of you by, by making that expression. Um, and most people, especially if they don't have a trusting environment or a strong corporate culture, most people don't want to feel vulnerable. It's dangerous to feel vulnerable. If you admit you made a mistake or you don't know what you're doing, you've been promoted into a job that you have no clue or no business being in that job, lying, hiding and faking is a much better option, right? Um, but for the fact that it's more stressful and ultimately the results will falter, right? right? It's, it's counterintuitive. But that's what, that's what a strong environment means. It means I can be vulnerable. So the fact that you can say that out loud means that there is a, a loving, trusting culture here that is okay with you being vulnerable. Nobody's thinking, oh my God, who, this company is 
going downhill. This guy's nuts. He's, you know, he's he's blubbering all over the place. You know, that's not what people are thinking. I mean, some people are probably thinking it, <laughs> but but generally, that's not what people are thinking. If anything, people are going cool, and that then inspires them to feel that they can also express vulnerability, like admit a mistake, like say they screwed up, like say they need help, that say, you know, they want to offer help to someone and not fear that either. Um, so that's that's one perspective. The other the other reason why stuff that I talk about or that you're talking about now is so often ignored is just because it's hard to measure. You know, how do you measure leadership? How do you measure? That's going to be one of my questions. How do you measure? How do you measure trust? You know, it's, they, they lack good metrics. It's very easy to measure uh, revenues and profits and market share. So let's focus on those things because I can I can like pull a lever here and see what happens over there. Right. But in terms of like trust, I'll pull a lever here and I won't see anything for six months. So it's not that I don't know that it exists. Everybody talks about the importance of culture, yet nobody seems to be focused on building it. I've never met a CEO in my in my life who doesn't think people are important, and yet every day they're making decisions that prioritize a number over a person. Yeah. That literally don't care about people. They make decisions that literally um, brush people aside. Um, um, because it's hard to measure in an ultra speedy, you know, uh, algorithmic world that we live in. Um, what gets measured gets done.